THE PSYCHOLOGICAL MOMENT Nobody thought that Alberic would ever marry. Apart from all other considerations, he was much too old. Yet now, at the end of three years, his friends were obliged to confess that the marriage was as much of a success as could have been expected, in view of the difference in the respective ages and characters of the two parties concerned. For she was almost a child. In his selection of a wife he had displayed, as usual, his penetration and knowledge of the fair sex. Sylvia, with her rose-leaf complexion, her perfect figure, the sunlight of her ruddy hair, and all those external charms to which no one had been more susceptible than her husband, could have done with him whatever she liked, dissipated his means, turned him to ridicule, converted him into a devil. She did none of these things. By honoring Alberic and his position, she silenced scandal and demonstrated that he had not read amiss the signs of nobility in her features. Who was Alberic? A mere nobody, so far as wealth was concerned. A peer, but not altogether a languid load of the earth. He had thrust himself before the British public on various occasions by his brilliant administrative talents. Long ago, as governor of Upper Somnolia, he had developed a disquieting energy that convulsed the permanent staff, who, up to their dying day, spoke in an odd whisper of that reign of terror. As author, he was studied by a select few who could sympathize with his passion for minute researches into certain aspects of history, a passion, the origin of which may be traced to a justifiable pride in many of the romantic vicissitudes that his own family, in the course of centuries, had undergone for he was one of those families renowned of old for intrigues and escapades and adventures in which, as a rule, the Ewig Viblica played no inconspicuous part. For the rest, he had glided through life unobserved by the many. Hereditary feebleness of constitution, a tendency to vices, were counterbalanced by other qualities envied of most men who can only acquire by patience or bitter experience what he likewise naturally inherited from these interminable ancestors, tact, insight, taste. He was quick to judge of a man's worth as of a woman's beauty. His tact was equal to the most embarrassing situations. Self-centered? Doubtless, but courteous at the same time, and generous to all mankind, particularly to pretty women. Ill health, unhappily, had somewhat soured his temper of late, and drawn more frequent lines about his smooth-shaven, once handsome features. His hair was of the thin texture of one who has lived, perhaps, too well. They had just returned from a winter in Egypt. The pale, ungenerous rays of an early spring afternoon penetrated through the lace curtains of their London drawing-room. Sylvia, standing at the window, drew them aside to let in more light. She had never found England so gloomy before. She was still dazzled with the remembrance of the glowing sunsets, the orange tawny desert, the monstrous cravings and all the strange experiences of the last months. For she was none too old to feel wonder, nor too affected to profess indifference. She had been brought up unacquainted with the world, its marvels, its realities. Like some hothouse flower, she had hitherto breathed the tepid atmosphere of London society, knowing nothing of the storms of life, nothing of its intense joys, nothing of such joy as the snowdrop fields in that sweet awakening from its wintry sleep amid the rough caresses of the northern wind. Impulsive and ambitious by nature, she had early learned demure ways. The recollection of that wonderland of Egypt had aroused new interests in her, vague yearnings, hitherto unfelt, for another existence. She ventured to open the window, after casting an anxious look to assure herself that Alberic was well protected from the air. The moist warmth poured in, and with it came wafted all the seductive lassitude of spring, the hopes, the fears the tender longings that penetrate on such days to the soul of man even through the smoky shell of a great city. A passive life. She had expected more of marriage. She wondered what ailed her. Looking around, she saw contentment everywhere, save in her own heart. 
Outside, the street passengers passed one another briskly before her eyes, each intent upon his own particular duty. All was life and activity. The carriages, emerging with cheerful din from the bluish haze, splashed through the river of gold at her feet and vanished again like streaks of light. Some children were playing on the glittering wet asphalt near the house steps. She listened a while to their merry laughter, and then closed the window sadly. At such moments Sylvia had an intuition of what life might have been. There was indeed a void somewhere, a great void in her existence. If she were at least allowed to continue her music. Alberic's voice, frail and high-pitched, but of peculiar charm, broke in upon her meditations. You will require cheering up in this gloomy place. You must take to your violin again, Sylvia. How can I? she replied regretfully. You know you forbade me. Allow me, dearest, to apologize for my mistake and my unkindness. You must bear with me, and pardon the unamiable caprice of an invalid. You don't know what it is to be an invalid. And he sighed, a very sincere sigh. He added, I feel now as if I could dissolve away upon the strains of your instrument. But I wish, I wish. Perhaps he wished for youth. Sylvia did not always fathom his wishes. Barely twenty years of age, she felt quite a child beside him, more especially as he seemed to take pleasure in deliberately keeping her ignorant upon many matters. How can one be so old, she often wonderingly asked herself, and yet feel such a child? But she, at least, had often endeavored to interest herself in his occupations, whereas this was certainly the first time that he had alluded to her playing in an appreciative manner. Perhaps, she thought, it might really do him good. She was solicitous for nothing so much as his health, his enfeeblement only fostered her devotion. Upon that score, Alberic allowed himself to cherish no illusions. He was approaching the seventh climactric, beyond which he could hardly hope to pass. Certain fainting fits had warned him of serious organic trouble, and the weakness had become more apparent since his marriage. For alas, the union, though a happy one, had been, in other respects, a grievous miscalculation. Alberic had drooped and faded away like some tender convolvulus in that glorious sunshine. He had hoped to enter upon a second youth with an infusion of new life, but it came contrarywise. He gave all, receiving nothing in return. The ruddy vampire, innocent of intent, drained away his life. Egypt, he felt, had done him no good. Presently he renewed the subject. I suppose after this long pause in your studies, you will require a teacher, at least at first. No answer. Sylvie was thinking of her former teacher, Lennox, a young Scotchman of more than common talent. Looking back now upon the past days of their intercourse, she felt that he had gained more influence over her than she cared to admit. Indeed, the Scotch Paganini, as he was called, exerted by the mere strength of his character a strange power over all who came in contact with him and could appreciate the high aims of his life. Born to a good family, he had deliberately chosen in early youth the art of the violin as a profession, and had pursued his studies stubbornly, with that craving after perfection, that determination to excel, without which genius is an empty name. His pupils were few, wealthy, and of highest promise. His infrequent appearances on the concert platform were the signal for unwanted outpourings on the part of the press. The critics, with patriotic fervor, compared him to some young high priest, pale with the scourge of study, about to initiate an unbelieving world into the mysteries of which he was the chosen interpreter. To see his sober mien, his well-bred, conciliatory bow to the public, was as good, they said, as a liberal education. And then, the way in which he took his instrument out of its case and lovingly, reverentially, tuned it, constituted in itself, they declared, a poem, a revelation, a revelation, 
Sylvia was wondering what had become of Lennox. No doubt, among the interests of an active professional life, he had already forgotten his former pupil. Why not, Lennox? She started at the sound of his name. But Alberic was smiling an enigmatical smile. It was really as if he had mentioned Lennox on purpose, as if he had led her thoughts up to this point for some object of his own. What that object might be she could not even guess. She remained silent, but her husband insisted. What if you wrote to Lennox? He was looking at her now, in a manner that almost scared her. There was mingled defiance and regret in his eyes. Was it love? Some composite emotion, no doubt, that he could not or would not formulate. But why speak of Lennox? Why speak of him, the unfolder of her talents, to whom she had looked up with childlike veneration, whose name conjured up the now forbidden fairyland of art, whose remembrance she had erased from her young mind, not perhaps without a sigh. To be permitted to take up music again was almost too good to be true. But why Lennox? Alberic persisted. I have blamed myself bitterly all this time for discouraging your love of music. No, don't thank me. I am only doing what I ought to have done long ago. Forgive me, rather, for this delay. I met him once, Lennox, I mean. Seems a gentleman. You were his favorite pupil, I hear. And if so, I am sure you will become his favorite pupil again. You can go on with him, you know, where you left off. He looks as if he could appreciate favorite pupils of your style. Here he laughed and soon added almost imperiously, Write to him, dear, and make an appointment. This speech confused her considerably. Alberic had a way of making ambiguous allusions to her person that were absolutely incomprehensible to her. She tried to puzzle out his meaning. He evidently expected her to say something. Really? She inconclusively faltered at last. And then more resolutely, Why Lennox? Why not indeed? But Sylvia, instead of rejoicing, grew sad. She sighed, as if with an immense despair, for she seemed to see, advancing towards her, some ill-defined, terrible phantom that threatened her future peace and happiness. Since her marriage she had never seen the Scotch Paganini. She only knew this much, that soon after that event, he had broken off his English engagements and had left London for the continent in order to perfect his already highly chastened style, so the papers announced, under a certain master in the Belgian capital. All this was true enough. There, locked up in his room, violin in hand, he wrestled anew with his old opponent, struggled with the brute material of string and bow, purged away, through sheer physical exhaustion, every other remembrance of life. Here was an adversary worthy of himself, endowed with more than human obstinacy, one who gave no advantages. All the yielding must be on his side. But Sylvia did not know. How could she? Ignorant as she was of his nature, that Lennox now lived like one who, gazing long into the sun, yet sees its spectral image burning everywhere his glance may stray, that amid the mazes of Tartini and St. Signs were mingled and floated and glowed persistently before his mental eye, the picture of her own ambrosial smile, the golden witchery of her hair. For his character was primitive as Alberic's complex. He was one of those men of natural, not acquired, purity, who, oppressed with disappointment and temptation, are not led away by the allurements of Venus Volgivaga, but cling to their first ideal, and exalt it with all the devotion of their simple natures. And in the course of these few years he had experienced, in his own person, a singular phenomenon. In proportion as he schooled his judgment and delved deeper into the mysteries of musical art, mastering its intricacies, realizing its limitations, discriminating its beauties, the picture of Sylvia likewise became clearer and more lovely. His taste, refined and exclusive, 
enabled him now to discover charms in her person that had hitherto escaped his appreciation. He could detect no discordant note in that roseate symphony. One might almost think that day by day, as the artist grew more discerning, more enamored of pure form, Sylvia, on her part, shook off the attributes of common mortality and resolved herself into the incarnation of all harmony and proportion. From being beautiful, she had become flawless. And, after these radiant visions, the reality. Lennox, who used to have faith in his star and believe in the ultimate adjustment of fate, was growing sadly despondent. But when, on the eve of his departure for England, he emerged from the three years' fray emaciated as with monkish self-chastisement, when he had deposited his violin for the last time in its case and asked himself, wearily, what next? His eye, roving round the room in a farewell glance, happened to fall upon a letter that lay at his elbow. It must have arrived that very evening. If, in a moment of self-flattery, Lennox imagined that he owed his introduction to Alberic's household to some machinations on the part of Sylvia. He was quickly undeceived by her grave demeanor that silently rebuked such an assumption. To whom, then, was he indebted for this honor? He took to observing Alberic closely, but Alberic wore a mask. He had met his advances with dignified ease and professed to take the greatest pleasure in bringing Sylvia and himself together. Was Alberic then the far-seeing grown blind? To their duets he often listened with rapt attention. At other times he leaned back on the couch, book in hand, and seemed to doze. Perhaps he marched, in imagination, with the scared veterans of Pizarro upon some incredible expedition across the Peruvian Sierras, or saw himself gliding pliantly, obsequiously, among the gilded pageantry of Versailles. Perhaps, who knows, he was watching Sylvia all the time out of the corner of his eye, and taking a kind of pleasure, as Lennox surmised, in the spectacle of a resistance to his own insidious attacks. A cruel amusement, but one characteristic of his complex nature. Or was it all generosity on Alberic's part? Generosity to himself. A perverse form of generosity, and a dangerous one. But Lennox soon, very soon, desisted from attempting to solve the enigma of Alberic, and confined himself to Sylvia. He thanked God for this opportunity of seeing her, whoever its immediate author might be and made the most of it. He was no lover of the sugar-water type. Lennox, the dreamer in Brussels, had changed considerably since his arrival. All the energy stored up during those years was released at the sight of his ideal. His primitive passions, aroused by personal contact with their object, ignited as a consuming fire. He never attempted to conceal from Sylvia the state of his heart, he waxed bold, impetuous, reckless. She, womanlike, was ill at ease. She could not help inwardly reproaching her husband for thus willfully exposing her to temptation. But whatever her thoughts may have been, her external conduct remained irreproachable, although at times she felt her power of resistance giving way before the impetuous desire of the other one. What rendered her defense doubly difficult was his assumption that she had loved him from the beginning, him and him only, and that she loved him still. How disprove it? How disprove what she now almost confessed to herself to be true? To this embarrassment was added her own susceptibility to that art of which, in her eyes, the exponent and personification alike was Lennox, whose genius she revered, whose single-hearted devotion to herself she could not but recognize with respect. Her acute sensibility to music unstrung her reserve and opened new vistas to the spiritual eye at which she trembled. She knew not why. There came upon her, under that spell, visions that she would fain have bidden linger forever, visions of a celestial dawn, the unfolding, as it were, of some proximate, unspeakable bliss. Looking up timidly in such moments, 
she would find his eyes fixed upon her in a steadfast gaze. He had divined aright, and their thoughts thus coinciding, their lips, unmoved, would say, Our joy, our hope, how shall we conceal it from him? Conceal it? Alberic knew the truth from the beginning. He knew of their growing infatuation and the inevitable consequence. But he thought he could surely trust Sylvia so long as he lived. She would keep the Scotchman within bounds, whatever his pretensions might be. Soon enough he would be dead, and then they might do what they liked. Another year or two, and then the odious change. In the contemplation of that change he recoiled. His worldly yet sensitive mind, that had dwelt long upon the theme of horror, shuddered at the prospect of a fair human body, that exquisite engine of delights, its right of existence withdrawn, its individuality remorsefully snuffed out, becoming a masterless, meaningless heap, a clod to be handled irreverently, abhorrently, by common persons, once loved now loathed the ball men, and thrust at last, unresisting into a coffin, the end of all things, or rather not the end, but only the beginning of that yet more hideous transformation beyond. How inconceivably hateful it all was! Alberic was loath to part with life. It had dealt fairly with him. He had neither feared nor despised the pleasures of the world. He only deplored his inability to enjoy them as heretofore. To console himself, therefore, he had devised an amusement intelligible only to self-indulgent, hypersensuous natures like his own. The spectacle of the two lovers ready to faint within one another's arms, a spectacle that would have driven to desperation most men in his position, afforded Alberic a voluptuous relish, a new zest in life. He had arranged it specially for himself, it was a risky undertaking, he knew, but the temptation had been too great to resist. Alberic was no spendthrift, no drunkard. At a race meeting at Monte Carlo, he could afford to laugh at the weakness of his fellow creatures. Transport him to a desert island, bereft of women, and he would have shared his last crust with some shipwrecked sailor. But to anticipate, in the person of Lennox, whom he had selected by some veritable intuition of genius, those joys that he himself could no longer taste, to watch, with sensual interest, a faltering rehearsal of the drama that he well knew, would be played immediately after his death. This was a temptation after his own heart. Before the idea was fully developed, he had already yielded. And he enjoyed his jest prodigiously, the bitter aftertaste only served to tickle his appetite. It possessed, besides the requisite spice of wrongdoing, of perversity, without which Alberic's pleasures had long ago become insipid. For some time past he had been engaged upon a careful study of their characters. He often looked from one to the other and pictured to himself how they would act, their very words, their caresses. Thus, and thus he would say, complacently, thus, and no wise differently. Then he would take note of their present exasperation. It was like perfume to his senses, and almost compensated for his regret at leaving the world. Yet at times he grew tired of his comedy and told himself plainly the truth. He envied their health, their youth, their beauty. He was afraid of death and his complacent smile would then crystallize into a hard grin of defiance that distorted his still attractive features. It was a remarkably dull melody that they were playing, or rather, no melody at all. Bach, he thought. Upon an ottoman under a stately drooping palm, his head upon one hand, his feet crossed, he reclined in a calm and languid attitude that had something of the rigid grace of the leaves that overhung and shadowed him. Little could be seen of him save the sinuous outlines of his figure. But he lost nothing of the scene, and his eyes were fixed upon Sylvia where she stood, violin in hand, beside an immense lamp, whose rosy shade tinged her white shoulders with a warmer glow.' 
they followed the vigorous motion of her arm glancing in the light and rested occasionally upon her scarlet lips parted in emotion he surveyed her as a connoisseur might survey some flawless tanagra statuette from her well-poised head refulgent in golden glory down to the dainty feet encased in that particular moment in slippers of a peculiarly appetizing description she was palpitating with young life the pose he thought was absolutely perfect as for her coloring she had all the loveliness of a naiad with nothing of her chill oh yes there was no denying her beauty damn it and if he were only twenty years younger or even ten she had actually improved he thought since her marriage her eye was brighter fuller while that veiled look of maidenhood yet lingered about those lips her waist was still that of a young girl he laughed uneasily and his glance wandered in the direction of the scotchman who under some pretext had laid aside his instrument and contrived to take up at the piano a position convenient for eyeing sylvia he played a listless accompaniment only accentuating a phrase here and there alberic whilst admiring the young man's adroitness began to feel almost sorry for his continued repulses at the hand of sylvia in his present somewhat cheerless mood he needed distraction he would have liked a little more movement in the play some diverting incident that might have afforded him the opportunity of making one of his withering but proverbial tactful remarks and exulting over their subsequent discomfiture they were such very correct lovers he was almost tired of their correctness but lennox far from being animated had become preternaturally grave he was marveling at sylvia's music for she certainly played as she had never played before it was an artistic problem that wholly absorbed him he lost sight temporarily of the woman and saw only the performer and as she proceeded his astonishment at her mastery of the instrument grew apace he was surprised at her technique and control of expression he was amazed above all things at the loftiness of her interpretation then gazing into her face he saw that it was irradiated with joy transfigured by the magic of love her heart came out upon those strains the older man had not been slow to observe the alternation in her physiognomy and how the dull melody swelled into a peon of life his sensitive mind instantly guessed the import of the change sylvia for the first time was breaking down her reserve she was casting aside her veil of demureness and assumed indifference taking the lead encouraging her torpid lover here was a contingency for which he had not provided how would it end he knew her impulsive nature too well to think that once aroused she would rest content with half measures and what then as sylvia's husband he had been amused by her secret love for the other as her master he was irritated by this confession of it he began to dislike the wilful parade of her beauty and this parade of her sentiments under the disguise of music was yet more obnoxious to him with a sudden revulsion of feeling he told himself that the affair had gone far enough too far he saw his mistake but how to mend it he would gladly have spoken and put an end to the tension but how said about it sylvia played on regardless of his menacing look unaware in her exaltation of his existence and then that thought upon which he had often dwelt with a kind of insane pleasure suddenly thrust itself upon him in its most offensive aspect i will be dead soon dead the food of worms ah the sinister transformation the pitiful consummation and they thus and thus ah curse curse their folly and my own the blood was leaving his face upon which a malignant look had settled his breath came rapidly and he leaned forwards grinding his teeth and grasping in his long fingers a gossamer wisp of silken hair he still endeavoured to control his excitement 
knowing its pernicious effect upon his health. But she continued to play, and Lennox had dropped his hand from the keyboard and was staring wonder-stricken at his former pupil. He had not often heard Bach unriddled after this fashion. He seemed to have lost sense of time and place, and to roam far away, among cool wooded glades with the sunlight pouring through the glittering leaves overhead, to breathe the fragrance of dew-spangled moss and fern, to hear the caress of light winds playing among the crowns, and melodious rustling of leaves and streamlets, and all those charmed woodland voices which the master himself, in his solitary wanderings, had heard and thenceforth imprisoned everlastingly, coaxing their reluctant echoes into those numbers whose enchantment none but chosen spirits, little less than angels, can unseal. The heated London drawing-room, with its thousand artificial contrivances, its carpets, its bronzes, its general atmosphere of weary refinement, was invaded and filled by Sylvia's music as with a living breath of clean spring air. The snowdrops awakening. And in that hour the Scotchman's love, tainted of late by a worldly, carnal flavor, was again quickened and purified. He knew that Sylvia, the artist, had lighted her torch at the same altar as himself. She had demonstrated the nobility of her soul, her exalted intelligence, her right to the homage of common mortality. She ceased, flushed and breathing fast, and immediately it seemed to Lennox, as though a curtain were drawn aside. The artist had melted away from before his eyes, and he beheld again the woman whom he loved, radiant and adorable. And he knew the truth. This, then, was her answer to his pleading. It was an answer plain and altogether lovely. She loved him. But for the faded, frivolous form crouching yonder, he would have fallen upon his knees and worshipped her as a goddess. Love given and returned. What was lacking? Nothing, he felt, was lacking. Save the occasion. But when the strains had ceased to vibrate in the air, a profound silence followed. It lay heavy upon them all. Neither of the men seemed inclined to speak. At last Lennox remarked in a choked voice, A divine rendering. How hollow the words sounded, how trivial, tactless, almost impertinent, false. False indeed, he should have said surrendering. For Sylvia knew that she would now yield at the first touch of her lover's hand. Distance of space alone kept her upright. Lennox himself was aware how unworthy his remark had been of the dignity of the moment, but he was determined to break the spell, for in that silence he heard the throbbing of his own heart, and felt himself drawn towards her by a power stronger than his own will. There was danger in that silence. He still restrained himself, with difficulty, for her sake. Sylvia only shuddered. A sense of trouble had suddenly come upon her, as though she had been detected in some guilty action. She made no answer. There was another long pause. She ventured to look at her lover, but encountered a glance of fire that made her cast down her eyes bewildered. Alberic said never a word. So far as she could see, he was grinning from ear to ear in a meaningless fashion. The strain became intense, intolerable. Then she observed with dismay that Lennox had risen to his feet and was taking a step in her direction. He came still nearer, trembling with passion. He was now almost at arm's length. Heavens! Had he lost all control over himself? With a supreme effort she shook off the fascination and remembered Alberic. She quickly faced about and turned to her husband for comfort and support. Gladly enough, in that one moment, would she have thrown her arms around Alberic and cried beseechingly in his ear, Save me! Take me from him! Save me before it's too late! Once in his arms I am lost to you, lost for evermore. Why sit there and say nothing? Oh, Alberic, one word! Surely, she thought, Alberic would redeem the situation. He was notorious for his consummate tact. Alberic could always be relied upon to do the right thing at the right moment. 
Alberic had fainted away, 